You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda. Welcome to episode number 81 of the Unwritable Rant podcast. Y'all, I have a very deceptive glass of bourbon sitting next to me, and I am ready to dive in. So join a girl, won't you? Get a glass of your very favorite drink, raise it up, and let's say cheers. Oh, this bourbon is so crazy good. I am drinking A.D. Law's single barrel bourbon right now. And like I said, this is a deceptive bourbon. When you get it in your glass, you're going to see this gorgeous toffee color. And when you smell it, it is going to smell exactly like butterscotch. You're going to think, I've got a dessert in a glass right here. But I will tell you right now, you do not. That bourbon scent is lying. Instead, when you take that first sip, it's going to hit you right up front with a whole lot of black pepper. But then, as you go through it a little bit more, it's going to even out. It's going to take on more of a caramel sort of flavor, but definitely spice forward. And at the back end, it's sour. This is a fascinating bourbon, and I am thoroughly enjoying it. So these next few weeks of the month are going to be pretty crazy for my guy and I. We've got a bunch of travel coming up, including a trip to our favorite place in the whole entire world, which is Aruba. I gotta say, Aruba is spectacular, and I think what I like most about it is just the odd dichotomy of it. You get this crazy blend of tropical and desert, and I'll tell you, for an island that is, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 miles wide and five miles across, it is not too hard for two people like my guy and I to make an impression. Now, one of the things that we especially love about travel is seeing all of the crazy animals that an area has to offer which can be a little bit of a problem for the two of us because, well, we like to get a closer look sometimes. Like the last time we were in San Francisco. My guy and I spent quite a bit of time down in the Fisherman's Wharf area. We'd wake up early and go for long walks, and this one particular morning we had wound up on a pier. Now down at the very far end of the pier was a bird. Now I use the word bird loosely because from our vantage, The only resemblance that thing had to an ordinary bird was its beak. Honestly, it appeared more pterodactyl than bird. What with its hunched shoulders and bat-like wings and shifty eyes. And man, was that thing staring us down like we owed it money. Now, like I said, my guy and I love animals. Him more so than me, because I just have a general mistrust of wildlife. They are, after all, animals and could, at any moment in time, just decide to claw my face open. My guy seems to think that he has the the magic touch, if you will, when it comes to animals and that they will just flock to him, as evidenced by the incident a while back with him and a stingray pool. But me, I heed warnings. When a rattlesnake rattles, well, I know that that means danger. So when that bird was staring at us and kind of hopping back and forth on both of its feet, I knew that something was up with it. So I tell my guy, maybe we should turn around. But he wanted to take a photo, so we kept walking toward it. And with each step that we took, it got just a little bit more agitated with our presence. Now we're easing up to it slowly, and situated between us and the beast was a homeless man who had set up camp along the side of the pier. Now he's watching us progress towards the bird, and he calls out. He goes, hey guys! I wouldn't get too close to that thing if I were you. It's not friendly. I'm not normally one to take anything from strangers. But this guy wasn't offering me a lollipop to get in the back of his van. He was offering us a legit warning to stay the hell away from Rodan down there at the end of the pier. And that was enough for me. I let go of my guy's hand and I decided I would rather take my chances with the guy who lived in a refrigerator carton on the side of a pier Then with that beast, my guy was on his own to collect that picture. So as he got closer to the bird, it decided to give him another warning, and it let out a massive squawk. Huge, echoing sort of squawk that carried right across the ocean down to the other side of the pier. 
And I'll tell you, when that thing opened its beak, even from my spot on the side of the pier, I could see that it had a couple of fish heads and what looked like a human femur wedged between its teeth. But did that stop my guy? Of course not. He is suddenly transformed from Dr. Doolittle to some guy on a National Geographic mission to capture a still of this thing in its natural territory. Of course, it is now rapidly looking as though my guy is going to get his picture from below the bird's talons as he is carried off to a nest. But no matter. It's a photo op, right? So my guy lands directly in front of this pterodactyl. And he's got his phone out. He's messing around with filters and waiting for the perfect ray of light to hit this thing when the bird has finally decided that it has had enough. Now, to the bird's credit, it did everything it could to warn us off of its pier. And when the squawking and shifting and nasty looks failed, that left that bird with no choice. I watched in horror as it unfurled its wings, which seemed to stretch the entire expanse of the pier. It must have looked like a solar eclipse from where my guy was looking through the viewfinder of his phone. And before any of us, my guy, me, the homeless carton guy next to me could take a breath, the bird swooped down on my guy like something out of a Hitchcock movie. It chased him halfway down the pier just to teach all of us a little lesson about disturbing wildlife. And then, of course, it resumed its perch on the rail. Now, I tell this bird of prey story because I think of it every time my guy and I are confronted by wildlife. Even when we are in Aruba, where the animals are mostly drunk on sunshine and the backwash of leftover Mai Tais. Like last year, my guy and I had been drinking essentially for five days straight. So when we heard rustling in bushes on our hotel property, let's just say it was tempting. It was tempting enough, of course, to override our past experiences and inspire us to get our crocodile hunter on. So we hunker down on the sidewalk and peer into the bushes and find a lizard. A hulking Godzilla-style thunder lizard that had to be at least two feet long from nose to tail. It was the coolest thing I have ever seen. And it was just hanging out, chilling there in the bushes likely annoyed that there were now two people staring at it, getting ready to take its photo. So my guy, of course, grabs his iPhone and begins to get situated, and I look up and I see that across the way, two children have emerged from the beach and are staring at us. They look curious about us staring into the bushes and clearly want to know more about what's in there. Now, there is no faster buzzkill for me than a couple of children. And I don't want them bothering us any more than I'm sure that lizard wanted us bothering it, but no matter. So I decide to emit a little bit of a warning, and I give these two children one of my death stares. Y'all, I have one hell of a death stare. It has been known to turn people in their tracks from two blocks away. It is that powerful. However, children are apparently impervious to it because it didn't stop them. So they're creeping up closer to us. And I'm getting annoyed. I don't want them near us. So I decide to amp up my warnings a little bit. I nudge my guy. I point out to the ocean and I say rather loudly, I wonder how many children drown in the ocean every year. Well, that put a little bit of fear in the kids, but it didn't stop them. And the next thing I know, they're on top of us. They're huddled around my guy. They're curious and poking and prodding and just generally being annoying. Now remember, I warned them. I did my best to try and prevent them from coming over to us. So what happened next is absolutely entirely not my fault. My guy looks up, smiles a little bit and says, Hey kids, want to see a lizard? Maybe it was the glint in his eye. Maybe it was the way he smiled. But what was entirely unintentional turned out to be 100% effective. Those kids dropped their beach toys on the sidewalk, turned around, and ran away from us screaming bloody murder. Of course, my guy and I also took that as our cue to get the hell out of the area, too. And I'm sure the lizard breathed a very heavy sigh of relief with our exit. Because in situations where my guy and I are involved, you just got to wonder who the animals really are. (laughs) And with that, I'm going to have a little bit more bourbon.
Hang on, y'all. <sighs> oh, I love this bourbon. And amusingly, this deceptive bourbon is actually rather indicative of my next story. Because as my guy and I are today just making our preparations to get ready for all of our upcoming travel, I have to admit that there are no preparations more elaborate than the ones I made for my fake wedding. It all started with a question from my mother. I was a senior in high school, and she and I were grocery shopping. And as she perused cuts of meat, she casually turned to me and asked, Did you have sex with Ozzy Osbourne? I was tempted to say yes, and that we are raising three little bats out of wedlock. Because having recently turned 18, there were certain questions I was prepared to be asked by my mother. More subjective questions like, isn't that skirt too short, or did you do your algebra homework? Those were all fair game. Now, my mother and I had a decent relationship, but we both had our boundaries about what we would discuss. And sex, most definitely, thankfully, had never been on the list. Until then. She didn't look at me when asking the question and busied herself comparing pork loins after asking it, but she was clearly waiting for an answer. And oddly, she wasn't the first person who had asked me that question that week. I just hoped she'd be the one to believe me when I said I most definitely, absolutely had not slept with Ozzy. She looked relieved when I said it. My mother was never one to judge, particularly when it came to the guys that I dated. But the thought of her firstborn trading interviews with rock stars for sex was a little bit too much even for her. That was the rumor, you see. My high school operated like a less resourceful but far more sadistic version of TMZ. My so-called classmates had been churning out rumors about my involvement in the music industry since my sophomore year but this was the first time any of the gossip had escaped the school grounds. It was a cruel version of the telephone game, really. Only it involved me, random rock stars, and a train ticket I never bought. Apparently, some of the women in the PTA, or whatever school group my mother volunteered for, had taken it upon themselves to gleefully repeat what they'd heard from their own kids. This was, of course, the problem with growing up in a small town. There was no preventing people from dipping their fingers deep into your business. And these are the kind of women who would drink their dinner and sleep with their neighbors in holy grace, but have no problem chatting like hens and dishing dirt on everyone else. And I don't know what pissed me off more, the rumors in general, or the fact that people thought my taste in men was so bad that I would stoop to sleeping with Ozzy. Although I suppose that's the genius of the rumor. Those rotten kids picked the single most heinous dumpster fire they could think of and threw me right into it. Learning that the rumor had reached my mother made me realize that this was going way further than I wanted. And I realized I had three options. I could burn my high school to the ground, which was becoming increasingly attractive to me. I could ignore the rumor and hope that people forgot about it. Or I could take a stand. And I think y'all know me well enough by now to know that that is exactly what I did. You see, I didn't want to graduate being known as the rock slut of my senior class, particularly when I had done nothing to earn the distinction. In a perfect world, I could have just denied the rumor and people would have accepted it and then respected me for what I had accomplished. Because let's face it, interviewing Ozzy Osbourne is a huge deal for anybody particularly an 18-year-old girl who was doing her best to be recognized as a writer. But high school doesn't operate on that kind of reason and logic. High school operates on petty jealousies, insecurities, and malicious behavior. So I knew that if I wanted to change the way people were talking about me, I was going to have to start my own rumor. It was the only thing to do. I knew it. And this rumor was going to have to be simple, plausible, but absolutely juicy enough to get people to change their conversation about me. And in thinking about it, I realized there was really only one thing left that would do that. I was going to have to get married. Back then, marriage was still a really important thing to a lot of girls. In fact, many of the ones that I knew had been raised to believe that marriage was the ultimate end game. It was so ingrained in our upbringing that when we were younger, a lot of us used to stage pretend marriages. 
and that was my inspiration. Now, getting engaged in high school had definitely fallen out of fashion, but it wasn't unheard of. And that's why I knew it was going to be a big deal if I showed up engaged. So I sat down one weekend, I did a little planning and came up with a quick little checklist. And I'll tell y'all, staging an engagement was ridiculously easy. Now, the first thing on my checklist that I would need would be a groom-to-be. I debated on making up a guy, but that seemed a little impractical and complicated. I already had a perfectly good boyfriend who would be perfect to marry. He was a couple of years out of high school and lived several towns over, so I figured he was far enough removed from the situation that he would never know what I was up to. The next thing I was going to need on my fake wedding checklist was a ring. Even that was rather easy to acquire. My grandmother had given me a box of all of her old costume jewelry, so I did a little bit of digging in there and I found the perfect engagement ring. Admittedly, it was kind of tarnished and it had all of the luster of a car windshield, but it would do the job just fine. I didn't really think my classmates were going to be too concerned about color or cut or clarity. And all that left for me to do was show up on Monday morning and dangle that ring under the noses of a couple of the more gossipy girls. By the end of the week, that rumor was in full circulation. Now, sure, there were a couple of people who weren't entirely buying the story. And then there were others who wanted to believe that my parents had arranged my marriage in order to prevent me from disgracing the family. But I'll tell you, there is nothing that people love more than planning a wedding. And by the end of the second week, girls who had never spoken to me in my entire life were running up to me, eager to talk about wedding dresses and updos and cakes. In this stupid rumor, I had found a whole new world of popularity. By the end of the third week, wedding mania had taken such a strong hold over my senior class, there were girls showing up wearing their boyfriend's class rings and claiming to be pre-engaged. And then, of course, by the end of the month, my guidance counselor had to get involved. I hadn't heard from this woman since eighth grade when she helped me register for my freshman year. And now, all of a sudden, I'm getting called out of class to head on down to her office and talk about family planning. And the only thing more awkward than talking to my guidance counselor about family planning was talking to my mother about it. Now, right about now, y'all are probably wondering if I ever felt bad about what I was doing, about this elaborate lie that I had spread about myself. And I'll tell you, I did. I hated it. I felt stupid and ridiculous about the whole thing. But honestly, what I hated more was the fact that my petty, vile, stupid classmates had absolutely written off my accomplishments as nothing more than sexual hijinks. That is what I hated. So for as fucked up as this whole situation was, in my mind, I felt okay with it because I knew I was going to graduate having gotten the better of my classmates and not the other way around. Of course, I didn't exactly walk away unscathed. About two weeks before graduation, my Then boyfriend turned up at my parents' doorstep looking really pissed off. It turns out, I had absolutely underestimated the power of this rumor. Not only had it escaped the school grounds, it had traveled three towns over to this guy's mother. And she was so excited by the fact that her precious baby boy was finally going to settle down with a nice girl. She was willing to overlook the fact that she'd heard it from a neighbor and instead called him up all excited and insisting that he set up a dinner between her and my family so that we could all plan the wedding together. I tried so hard to explain the situation to him, but all my talk about counter-rumors and social manipulation, they fell on deaf ears. He wasn't having it. To him, I was nothing more than a marriage-minded maniac who wanted nothing more than to lock him into the suburbs and drown him in matrimonial hell. He broke up with me on the spot. And that hurt. I may not have wanted to marry that guy, but I definitely didn't want to break up with him. And I certainly didn't want to drag him down into my nightmare. So I can't say that I really blame him for breaking up with me. I absolutely deserved that one. 
I promised myself right then and there that the next time I decided to launch a little experiment in social manipulation, I would do my best to never take down anyone who didn't deserve it. In the end, graduation came and went, and we all moved on to life or otherwise outside of high school. Now, in thinking about this story, the other day I pulled out my senior yearbook. And I had to laugh because 90% of the comments in it are from people who were wishing me well on my upcoming nuptials. And the rest of it was just all the standard nostalgic bullshit from people that I have absolutely no recollection of. I gotta admit, though, I do take a little pride in saying that Ozzy Osbourne's name was never mentioned once. And with that, I'm raising up my glass of bourbon, and I am not drinking to anybody from my high school. Ugh, bourbon. I think that should just about wrap up our time together this week. Now, before I go, I do want to share some very cool news. There is a new webcomic series coming out called The Kindred Homecomings, and I am a character in the comic book. I gotta say, it is incredibly surreal to see myself as a comic book character, but it is so freaking cool. And you are going to love this comic. It's a retelling of the 80s horror movie The Kindred, with a couple of new twists and turns and some very cool characters. And I am so proud to be a part of this project. So if you want to check it out, just head on over to snugcomics.com. Or hit me up on Twitter. I will be happy to send you the link. And now, I'm going to go get cozy with what's left of my bourbon. I'll be back again next week to chat. Cheers, y'all. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. You can hear new episodes of The Unwritable Rant on RadioVegas.rocks every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern and on IPMNation.com on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern and hear best of episodes every weekday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning Standing on the corner at Carondelet What you say we make a way up to Bourbon a Couple hurricanes and a hand grenade And get blown away Let the chips fall where they may If it's all the same What you say, bon ton, yeah, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this